So we're going to veer off onto a cultural ta uh, tangent of the second half of today's lecture. Um, but I think you'll enjoy it because I may not enjoy it because I'm talking about the kind of decline and fall of my own country. But um, I, think, I think you'll find it interesting because, look, numbers are numbers. You look at things like the value of the currency, the value of gold, inflation, trade statistics. It's all important. It's a little dry. As I agree. All of this stuff, though, has serious consequences, and not just in terms of whether or not people have their jobs. I was beginning to allude before the break at some of the socio-cultural consequences we might call inflation. In its essence, inflation is a betrayal. I think that the Romans, and in fact, kind of the pre-moderns, had a better phrase for inflation than, than we. They called it debasement. That is debasing the currency, which is literally what a government is doing when it prints money on control. It is literally taking the money that you have in your wallet and eroding its value from one day to the next. You know, so that this 20 lira note, like all Turkish notes, has got, of course, Kemal's picture on it. It's interesting because we've got different presidents on our notes, but I love how Kemal is on all of them. He's on the 20, he's on the 50. You know, this 20 might be worth 20 in some nominal sense today, but a month from now it might only be worth 19. And six months from now, maybe 18. And another year after that, maybe 15. All of that, of course, depends on the behavior of your government officials, particularly and usually, in fact, unelected officials who sit on various boards, the national banks and so on, but who, of course, in the end, do tend to take their orders from the elected politicians. Now, None of us are entirely, of course, able to escape some blame. Most of us, well, some of us anyway, vote. The people we vote for tend to give us what they think we want and to give it to us good and hard, as some people like to say. So maybe it is, in a way, what we want. Maybe we do want soft money policies designed to prop up employment which is, of course, what we have in today's America, where the government prints trillions and trillions of dollars so that no government employee ever has to take a pay cut. Many people, of course, don't like that because, as I have said, some people benefit from inflation. Now, first and foremost, of course, and you can't make enough of this, those who work for the government because the government prints money so that it can pay them. So the people who work for the government benefit. People who borrow money and then pay it back in a debased version of itself, they benefit. So debtors benefit. Creditors do not. People who kind of behave properly, that is, they save their money, they don't indulge themselves, they don't spend themselves into oblivion, they also get hurt. I talked about this a little bit when we looked at Weimar Germany. It's a famous case, of course. Uh, I talked about the beer hall putsch, how, you know, the funny version of the story is, of course, right before, you know, Hitler jumps on the table, his aide buys him a beer, it costs, what, you know, 4.8 billion marks or some ridiculous figure like that, because of the debased paper inflation. The social consequences of that inflation in Germany, though, were in some ways even more interesting. You had a kind of breakdown of what we might call bourgeois morality. It is a betrayal, as I have said. The government is essentially betraying its promise to you. Its promise that the full faith and credit of the government, this is what, if you look at like the dollar bill, this is what it's supposed to be. To honor all debts, private and public, public tender. Uh, the full faith and credit of the U.S. government stands behind this. Now, if you were a German in 1920, you would spend your whole life probably as a German, you know, working hard, saving your money, doing the right things, not blowing your money on, you know, some debauch, not blowing it on something you couldn't afford. You've done all the right things, and now the government had basically told you to screw it. You lost simply because you had done the right thing. Well, of course, this causes people to begin questioning, well, should I really do everything the government tells me to do? Should I really believe what the government says? Should I really deny myself pleasures today? I mean, one thing you can do, of course, if the government is debasing your currency, you know, if you want to be really clever about it, you can, as I've said, you know, borrow up money and buy things like gold, silver, oil, commodities, real estate. If you're not that clever, or if maybe you're of a slightly different temperament, you might as well just spend the money, right? 
It's worth more today than it is tomorrow. So go out and have fun. Go out and buy yourself a new TV. You know, go out to that new nightclub. Maybe, you know, spend it on a prostitute if you're a man. If you're a woman, I suppose you could go for a gigolo, or maybe you could just behave a little bit irresponsibly for a few nights. You know, go out with the girls, you know, drink it up, flirt with some boys. Whatever floats your boat, go do it. You know, spend money. Spend the money because tomorrow it won't be worth anything. This tends to happen in all inflationary countries. It was famously true, and I have some experience of this, in Moscow in the 1990s, when particularly, that happened twice. Like in the early 90s, there was a huge collapse of the ruble. And then again, after the financial crash of 1998, there was another collapse of the ruble. Um, I mean, just, I'll, I'll give you like a very brief summary of like what this meant for me personally, because it's kind of amusing. The first time I went to Russia in 1998, I was a graduate student with a very small income. Income isn't even the right word for it. Like I had a grant of money I needed to like make last for the summer. A taxi ride would cost like 10, 20, 30 dollars, even if you're only going five minutes. All of the uh, kind of restaurants and bars were out of my price range, and so I couldn't even really afford to go out to eat. Then, I went back six months later. The ruble had collapsed. It had gone from what? It had gone from like six to the dollar to about 30 to the dollar. So suddenly I was five times richer than before. God, it was fun. <laughs> I could take taxis wherever I wanted. I'd go to any restaurant I wanted. I could sidle up to any bar and, you know, buy some girl a drink. Very, very easily. It was a lot of fun. And of course, the people, shall we say, don't tend to behave as... I'm not going to go into some of my misbehavior. But anyway, I didn't behave like a saint. You know, I had a lot of fun. So did everyone else. Even people who are themselves not as well off as I was, they were having fun too. Because that's the thing. It's like, what do you do? You take your money and you spend it. You go out you have a good time. If you have money, that is. Of course, if you don't have money, you're even more out of luck. But so you tend to have this kind of phenomenon. Now, America's inflation, that is roughly kind of like 1960 until... It was finally wrung out by around 1983. This coincided not accidentally with the collapse of a whole system of social morality. America, as you probably have heard and you probably know, is a Christian country, at least nominally. America was settled, if you remember from last term, by dissenting Protestants. You know, people who thought that even Protestants weren't strict enough about things. Even Protestants didn't take the scriptures seriously or literally enough. You know, remember the Protestants had objected because the Catholics were immoral. And then the Protestants themselves started objecting to other Protestants not being moral enough. So the ones that went to America, the Puritans and the Quakers, you know, these were people who thought you really needed to live by a serious moral code. I mean like a really serious moral code. You know, compared to, I suppose, Islam, maybe in some ways not that much stricter, but when it came to something like sexual morality, absolutely so. You know, obviously you didn't have, the Mormons, it's true, the Mormons had polygamy, but everyone else, you know, obviously, adultery is off base, premarital sex is like not even something you would think about, uh, virginity extremely highly prized, as it is, of course, in all religions. But then there were other, like, financial behavior was also extremely strict. It's not that you couldn't borrow money, you could. But you definitely were not supposed to get into debt. You know, people had a horror of debt. And then, of course, the way they behaved kind of prim and proper with their you know, dress codes and so on. I suppose in some ways you could say Islamic countries today are even stricter in some ways than America was. But anyway, it was a very strict moral country. There was hypocrisy, of course. But I'll give you an example of what I mean. You may have noticed if you ever watch a really old Hollywood movie that there's no nudity, right? You don't see you know, women's breasts. You don't see men, obviously, below the waist. You don't see any of that. Not only this, but you don't hear anyone swearing, right? There's no bad language. It goes deeper than this. Any Hollywood movie made before 1965 had specific rules about the plot. It wasn't just that you couldn't have, again, like sort of visible you know, sexuality. You also couldn't have people behaving immorally. Anyone who committed a crime was not allowed to get away with it. Think about this for a moment. Think about a movie a couple of years ago, The Italian Job. Yeah. You guys probably saw that, right? The whole movie is about these criminals, right? They rip off some gold in Italy, 
One of them robs from the others, so I guess that's bad, because like he robbed from the other criminals. And then they'll go, go to Los Angeles, and then they rob the gold from him, and then they toast each other with champagne, you know, because they robbed the gold. <laughs> this is the new Hollywood morality. It glorifies crime. I mean, come on. They even act like no one was victimized by this. Well, it's only $35 million in gold, obviously. You know, there's no victim to this crime. This is the new Hollywood. Violence committed randomly, that's part of it. You know, obviously, like, gross acts of sexuality, all of that. No, the really key thing about the Hayes Code is that you were not allowed to get away with the crime. Like, if you ever watch those old... Uh, you know, like the black noir movies, the cinema noir movies from the 1940s. Yeah, they get into all this, like, cynical stuff about crime and, you know, uh, moral dilemmas. But if you watch them really closely, crime never pays, because that was the old code. Well, they blew that to smithereens in 1965. It's curious that Hollywood, because it's, it always likes to congratulate itself, Hollywood always publishes these figures, and they say, like, box office revenues have hit another peak this year. You know, well, yeah, of course, if the currency is being debased and you keep printing more money, then it stands to reason that, you know, if film tickets now cost $12 and they used to cost $1, yes, you're going to make more money in the literal sense. But if you look at the real statistics of film attendance, they began declining in 1965 and have never picked up anywhere near what they used to be. And it's true, a lot of people like me, I don't particularly care. I mean, I go to watch the Italian job. I mean, you know, it's amusing, it's funny. But your serious Christians don't watch movies like that. They don't watch movies that have this kind of behavior. They just don't go to movies anymore. They literally don't. That's why everyone was shocked a couple of years ago. Mel Gibson made this, you may remember his movie about Christ, you know, in the crucifixion. And no one in Hollywood would finance it. Because it was Christian, oh my God. They said, oh, nobody's going to watch that movie. That movie made something like $400 million. Because all these Christians who won't go to any other movies, they went to that movie. Anyway, so like this gap opens up, you know, between like the, the Christians and the heartland and the main culture. The gap, I, I alluded it to it the other day with this silent majority idea, you know, that Nixon, Nixon in 1972 won more than 60% of the vote. And famously, uh, Pauline Kael, the film critic of The New Yorker, she had this immortal remark. She said, how did Nixon win? I don't know a single person who voted for him. And of course she probably didn't because, you know, she lived in Manhattan and she hung out with, like, film people. None of them voted for Nixon. But 60% of the public did, and that's a pretty dramatic victory. You have this huge gap opening up between, you know, some people call it, like, the elites or the coasts, you know, like New York, and then the heartland, or some people call it, cynically, flyover country. You know, that is where they fly over it in between New York and Los Angeles. And it began to emerge in these things like, you know, Hollywood and its values. Um, you know, other things, uh, the obscenity laws. This was interesting because we also used to have laws in America. Um, you know, again, you could make a parallel to a lot of Islamic countries that do have similar laws. That America used to be in some ways, I suppose you might say, more like them. Um, you know, things like, I, I was always shocked when I came to Turkey at how risque the newspapers are. You know, it's not like outright nudity, but you know, all these like women in bikinis on the cover of the newspapers. It's almost European. You didn't have any of that in America. Very strict laws on language, display, even things like novels. You know, novels would get banned. They would get censored if they were immoral. They used to have discussions about like James Joyce and his novels. And when the Supreme Court actually discussed this in 1968, what was great was like, because they're a bunch of old men mostly, you know, they're talking about all these novels from like the 1950s and earlier. And so when they talk about obscenity, they think it means like a novel that describes the sex act or something like that. They think it's, you know, maybe like there might be a few slightly racier novels. They didn't realize that by striking down the obscenity laws, you know, within five years you would have like round the clock porn stands on every corner in the country. You know, you would have these like XXX signs up everywhere. It's true, like if you drive on a highway now in America, you can't go five minutes without passing a sign for some, you know, like porn shop. My own favorite was right after the, I was at Yale for a couple of years, and right after the, uh, you know, the financial crash of 2008, there was this great big billboard on I-95 as you're driving up from New York City to New Haven with the slogan. It said, um, you know, VIP, you know, very intimate pleasures. Come and make your own stimulus package. 
I said, this is great, like, in-your-face ad. And, of course, it's amazing. America is supposedly a Christian country. The hotel room, this is a perfect example of this, right? You may have noticed if you've ever stayed in a hotel in America, most of them still have the Bible, right, like next to the bed. And yet... In almost every hotel room in America, you can now get like round-the-clock 24-hour pornography on demand. And that's all because they struck down the obscenity laws in 1968. You know, again, to the shock of like huge numbers of people. Um, this was also the year, a lot of stuff happened like in these key years here. This was also the year of the big student you know, riots all over the place, like Berkeley, the free speech movement, uh, the Sorbonne in Paris, eventually copycat movements everywhere. You know, the students, they, they wanted their professors to loosen up. Basically, they wanted better grades, I think, in the end. <laughs> so eventually, you got, like, the loosening of grades and grade inflation and all of that. You know, the point where now there's this famous professor at Harvard, uh, uh, Harvey Mansfield. He gives all of his students what he calls uh, an ironic grade. He gives them two grades. You know, one is the one that appears on the transcript, and the other is the one they actually deserve. <laughs> because he doesn't want to punish them just because they took his class. But since everyone at Harvard gets A's, you know, he gets almost everyone A's. But then he also gives them the grade that he thinks they actually deserve. Um, so, you know, the, the breakdown of academic standards followed from this, too. And, you know, a lot of it was, maybe it was intentional, maybe it wasn't. But it's part of the same movement. Again, authority is discredited. Tradition is discredited. The inflation, it's not the only factor, but it's a huge part of this. You know, the government, in a way, is betraying the people, and now the people are telling the government to screw off. You know, in all these polls, no one trusts politicians anymore. Everyone is cynical. Um, the obscenity laws are struck down. You get the student rights. You also had, actually, the Stonewall uh, riot in 1968. This is, it's almost been forgotten. Like, for a while, it was a big deal. Um, but this was when the police tried to break up a gay bar in New York City. Um, and, I mean, basically, it was an illegal establishment. You know, they were serving booze without a license. But, of course, in retrospect, it's a little bit like the Bastille in, you know, in France. The Bastille, yeah, all they had was, like, a couple of non-political prisoners. But it turned into this, you know, symbol of oppression. And so this turned into this, you know, symbol of oppression against gays. And, of course, much like these other laws I talked about, America as a Christian country used to have laws in every state forbidding homosexuality, as you would imagine, or sodomy, as they like to call it. Um, well, within a couple of years, most of these laws were being struck down. You know, not all at once, but so the gay rights movement kind of picked up steam. Now, a lot of this stuff you could say was, you know, welcome. I mean, America was a pretty stiff country back in the 50s. It was, uh, I suppose the word would be like conformist, right? You were expected to behave in a certain way. You know, men all cut their hair the same way. It was, it was like a military style because they had the universal draft. You know, everyone dressed almost like soldiers. Everyone had these little buzz cuts. You know, men all wore the same clothes. I mean, it's amazing to think that not that long ago, within almost living memory of many people, there used to be a dress code. You know, I mean, like you had to wear a hat when you went outside. You know, you put on a suit. I suppose in Turkey, in some ways, you have closer to this than we do, where most people who were employed actually, you know, like the men dress a certain way, the women dress a certain way. You know, America blew all of that to smithereens in the 1960s and 70s. Um, so, you know, fashion changed too. So some of it you can understand. You know, it's like chafing against authority. You know, the, the, the hippies, of course, you know, they famously thought that, you know, oh, well, sexual morality was hypocritical and their parents told them to do this and their teachers told them to do that. And so everyone wanted to rebel against everything. Uh, now, we have this phrase, uh, the baby getting thrown out with the bathwater. <laughs> it's like you throw the bathwater because, you know, you're done with your bath. The problem is that the baby might be there. You know, they got rid of a lot of, they got rid of like a lot of probably unnecessary stuff, but they also got rid of a lot of necessary stuff. A lot of it had to do with the race issue. Um, I think part of the reason that something like a student rebellion succeeded, that is the professors caved in, you know, a little bit like the way the Supreme Court caved in, Part of the reason the government, I think, allowed all of these laws to be overturned, allowed all the traditions to be overturned, was because it had lost a certain moral credibility because of the race issue. You know, for fairly obvious reasons. The U.S. had fought in World War II. Everyone had been shocked, of course, by what the Nazis had done, not just to the Jews, but to gypsies and other racial minorities. The Nazis, you know, with their race theory. People forget this, but... <clears throat> 
eugenics, which used to be a kind of pseudoscience, which had to do with race, which had to do with, you know, the idea of like trying to encourage people of, of the right breeding to have more children, trying to discourage people of either a different race or lower intelligence from breeding. It actually used to be kind of respectable in the Western world. The Nazis, of course, discredited everything. All of this became taboo. And then, of course, America had to confront the fact that it had virtual apartheid in the southern states, what they used to call Jim Crow. The Jim Crow laws, uh, you know, famously it would be something like the blacks would have to sit at the back of the bus. You know, they'd have like a special section where the blacks would sit. Uh, uh, bathrooms, you know, lavatories. There would be bathrooms for the blacks and bathrooms for the whites. And then, of course, famously, schools. Schools would also be segregated. So this phrase, the segregation of blacks and whites, the fact that the laws were unequal, I mean, literally unequal, unequal treatment, this, of course, was a betrayal of America's ideals. I mean, the Declaration of Independence, the whole notion that all men are born and created equal, which comes right from you know, Thomas Jefferson, the Declaration of Independence. It was obvious hypocrisy. And so if the government was hypocritical in one way, people thought, well, it was hypocritical in all the others too. And so eventually, all of this stuff gets kind of, again, thrown through the thresher and eventually discredited. Uh, the first step, at least along the road to the racial equality, was a Supreme Court decision in 1954 uh, called Brown. Most of these decisions, they have like a V or a versus in them. You know, you have two sides in the war. This one is known as Brown versus Board of Education. It was from Kansas, basically, and it had to do with schools being separate but equal. That was uh, a previous decision had said it was legal because, you know, even though they were separate, there was nothing that was supposedly better or worse about one or the other. This said it was illegal and unconstitutional because of the very act of separation. You could not have separate schools. Um, eventually, this led, you know, in the kind of landslide when LBJ is reelected in 1964. You know, they passed the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, all of which was designed, you know, again to rectify the injustice, to give the same rights to blacks as whites held. The Voting Rights Act, it, it's not that blacks weren't allowed to vote, but they had all these, you know, special rules making it extremely difficult, you know, ways they could be excluded, you know, based on this or that kind of criteria. This made it so the federal federal government would get involved in almost enforcing the law so that the southern states had to allow the blacks to vote. You know, and all of this was obviously very salutary. It was kind of getting rid of the worst legacies of, you know, racism and the, the former legacy of slavery. Um, there were a couple of problems, though, that were beginning to fester. When you look at desegregation, that is, the bringing back together of the races which were segregated, it sounded simple at first. But of course, it's not so simple. If you have the blacks going to one school and the whites going to one school, and that's not supposed to happen anymore, then what do you do? Do you like mix them together? You do like 50-50, but 50-50 doesn't make sense because you know, the whites are a majority, the blacks are a minority. So maybe like you take some of the blacks from one school and put them into the white school. You know, the other stuff was much simpler. You just get rid of the rules you know, with separate bathrooms, separate buses. Schools were different because, of course, schools get right to the fundamental nature of like what you believe is a society, what you teach, um, the future of your children, etc. All the cliches. The problem was, of course, that some of it was because of the law, but some of it was also just because the blacks tended to live in some places and the whites tended to live in others. Equality and desegregation both sounded great. But in practice, they turned out to be a bit complicated. Equality was particularly complicated when it came to women, which, of course, this was another big cause. Once you were trying to equalize the races, then naturally you started talking about things like sexual discrimination. Uh, they had something called the Equal Rights Amendment, which was supposed to men make men and women you know, equal in law, which, of course, again, sounds right, proper, and natural. But when you start applying this to other sorts of concepts, I'll give you an example. Sports. The idea was that it's unfair that schools spend money on sports teams for boys and not for girls. Well, it does sound unfair if you put it like that. On the other hand, what if you put it like this? There aren't enough women who are interested in playing, oh, I don't know, hockey to field a team. Therefore, the men are not allowed to have a team. <laughs> 
That is actually what the federal government rules today because of the equal rights legislation. This is actually so, the so-called Title IX of a law passed in 1971. Um, so that, in the end, the law is applied whether or not it kind of makes sense in commonsensical terms. The same thing was true with education. Eventually, you got from desegregation to what they later called, let me see if I wrote it up here. Uh, oh, yeah, busing. Okay, busing, just literally like bus, autobus. Busing. You would take kids from one school and bus them to another to ensure, that is, that the schools were not segregated between blacks and whites. Because as I've said, it tended to be a lot of blacks lived in one area and the whites lived in another. They did this all over the country. Most famously in Boston, it turned into a virtual civil war. Someone compared it to, it was a little bit like uh, in Romeo and Juliet, you know, the feud between the Capulets and the Montagues. You would have like a hostage from one family going to the other because they took, you know, the poorest and the worst of the black schools in inner city Boston and did an exchange with the poorest Irish white school. If you've watched any of those gangster movies about like the one with Jack Nicholson and a couple of years ago, The Departed, Martin, Martin Scorsese, you know, the Irish in Boston are famous, like they're famously thuggish, Southie, you know, Southie Boston, you know, so they're tough. And they don't mess around. And so what they basically did was they took a couple of unfortunate black students and sent them to this school of like virulent Irish working class racists. And then they took some of the virulent working class racist Irish and they put them in the school with these blacks. And what do you think happened? You know, there were riots, there were fights, you know, people got knifed in the cafeteria. The thing which made it even worse was this. No one voted for this law. The principle was all determined by the courts. You know, first here, and then later on there was another decision in 1971. Um, the courts made the decision. No one elected these court officials. They said, well, look, the law was this, and so you must do that. The man in Boston, his name was Judge Garrity. They came up with a great phrase to describe the policy of busing and desegregation. They called it, quote, a Harvard plan for the working class man. And the reason was because, of course, Garrity had gone to Harvard Law School, and he devised this plan. His kids, meanwhile, went to some private school, and so they weren't even affected. And this is always true of government officials. Um, and, of course, as a Harvard man, he didn't know anything about the problems of South Boston. Um, basically, what this, this eventually led to are all kinds of consequences. It led to the hollowing out of the cities, because if you did not want to be subject to this policy you hadn't voted for, you had to leave. And so this is when you got what was called white flight. Um, Detroit famously was probably the worst affected. You know, where Detroit, the inner city Detroit, it's like a wasteland now. Like, there's nothing there. Um, you may have watched the Eminem movie, you know, a few years ago, like Eight Mile. Eight Mile marks like the dividing line. It's like the old hollowed out inner city core of Detroit. You know, it's terrible, but this was the inevitable result of a badly thought out government policy. Again, the idea sounds great, equality, but what does equality mean? I'll give you another example. Equality and why it's so complicated. They have this legal concept they call disparate impact. You think about equality. You have either equality of opportunity versus equality of result. What the Declaration of Independence talked about, it was a little vague. You know, they said, um, we are all created equal. Okay, if you're created equal, that still doesn't mean you'll end up in the same place, right? Because you get born and then, you know, you grow up and presumably by dint of hard work, effort, talent, whatever, you succeed or you don't succeed. But the problem was this. When most people talk about equality, they, they mean something a little different. You know, they mean like, oh, I don't want that person to have more than me. Or I don't want it to be completely unfair that, you know, you got to, you know, go to an Ivy League school, Harvard, and then end up in a big mansion in Boston, whereas, you know, I'm living out in the dirt scrabble uh, backwoods of the Adirondacks. It doesn't seem fair to a lot of people. It especially doesn't seem fair if it seems like a different race is doing better than you. So here's the problem with disparate impact. The idea is, even if the law says everyone is equal, the results are different. Not enough you know, blacks or Hispanics or other minorities get into this law school, get into Harvard Law School. This is where you got affirmative action, so-called, you know, where you give preference to the racial minority. But there's more to it than that. Eventually, you have this problem in all institutions. Like with voting, they came up with the literacy. If you don't read and write, you don't get to vote. 
But that has a different impact on different races because different races have different statistics about how many read and write. These days, it's not an issue. Almost everyone is literate. But back in those days, it was still an issue. Another example is something like employment. Employers, they don't want to racially discriminate like in the literal sense, like we only hire white people or we only hire black people. But they might do it subtly in like a different way. They might have a test. And if that test impacts people differently, if the whites or the Jews or the Asians get this score and the blacks or the Hispanics or other immigrants get this score, well, that seems unfair. It all sounds very abstract, but there was actually a Supreme Court decision. Most Americans haven't heard of this, but it has immense impact, not just on America, on the entire world. It was a decision made in 1971. It was called Griggs versus Duke Power. Duke Power was an electricity, like a utility company. Um, a black who had not been hired sued them. You know, he said it was because of racism. You may have been right. No one really knows. What they decided, though, in this decision was that this power company, their claim was that, no, we didn't hire you because we have an exam for our employees to see how much they know about something like electrical engineering, and your score was lower than the others. They sued, and it is now illegal for private employers in America to have any kind of tests. It's illegal. They're not allowed to so that, again, they don't discriminate racially. The reason I say this is so important is because it doesn't just affect employment. It affects something like higher education, universities. Universities in America, this is like the dirty secret of higher education. I try to explain this to people who want to go do like a master's degree in America or something. Master's degrees, they're very cynical. They're just little cash cows. Nobody cares about math. It's a way of exploiting students. Education, though, at the undergraduate level in America has famously been hollowed out. If you study a hard science, you know, you'll still learn something. If you study one of these other pseudo-disciplines they have invented, you probably won't learn much at all. In fact, they, they have literally documented now that at most of the Ivy League schools and at UC Berkeley, where I actually got my graduate degree, most students actually know less when they leave than when they arrived. <laughs> there's, there's, there's this funny old phrase we have. Uh, People used to uh, give it as a quote at commencement addresses when people graduate. You know, the, the joke was that universities are storehouses of knowledge. The freshmen bring a little bit in, the seniors take none away, and it accumulates. <laughs> it's now literally true at many American universities. People don't really study. What do they do? I mean, you know, they party, they have fun. Like, it's, it's a good time. It's a good time which costs like $200,000. But, you know, if you want to spend your money on that, that's your business. The reason people still do it, though, it's literally because of this Supreme Court decision. Employers are not allowed to know what you got on, let's say, some kind of test. What they do instead is they look at what college you went to, and they use that as a proxy. So the whole thing is just, it's like kick the can down another road. People, this thing is, people learn about things like this. People get more and more cynical. This is one of the reasons, again, that everything was being discredited. The professors, they felt guilty because of, you know, years of injustice against blacks. And so when the students protested and they said, you're unfair and you're racist, they said, yes, you're right, we are. And they just kind of surrendered. And the same thing happened in one institution after another in America, where people just lost confidence in the rigorous, you know, of their own beliefs, of their laws. Eventually, you got a kind of thoroughgoing decadence in the culture. Um, and when I say decadence, I don't just mean, you know, educational standards plummeting and people not working as hard and people, you know, not believing in the government. I mean, by the late 70s, it's, you had a bit of this in Turkey with like your, you know, battles between, uh, you know, the left and the right in politics in Turkey. Yeah, everywhere in the world, the 70s were like a bad decade. You know, there was a lot of tension and violence and everything. But, I mean, America in that era, it came as close as it ever really had to, like your pure, cynical European style, like sexual social decadence. Like, there was this club called Studio 54 in New York. Yeah, you've probably heard of it, right? Studio 54, um, you know, it, was, it wasn't like a gay club. It was like half gay, half straight. Like, they encouraged, you know, obviously like gay coupling and other couplings too. And they would have people, you know, like making love up in the stalls above. People were snorting coke right in the tables. They're pumping heroin in the bathroom. You know, everyone is on drugs by the late 1970s. I talk about how the army was on drugs too. I mean, this was true like across the board. It was like rates of people using marijuana, cocaine, everything. It was just like through the roof. Um, 
My own, this is actually, this, I don't know if this is actually appropriate for the classroom, but you, I, I'm sure you know if you've ever been to a disco, you know the song YMCA, right? Yeah. YMCA. Like, do you actually know what that's about? Well, YMCA stands for Young Men's Christian Association. Um, you know, it's an organization where uh, basically it's, it's supposed to be partly for young kids, boys, obviously, but, you know, also maybe for the poor, maybe for people who don't have parents or homes. Like sometimes, like, it gives them, a, you know, like a place, to, a place to live, a place to stay. Sometimes it just gives them activities like sports and things like that. But, of course, young boys, you know, to, uh, uh, ah, that's what they're talking about. It's the village people. They're talking about cruising for boys, basically. That's what YMCA is actually about. I hate to break it to you, but that is what this whole era was actually about. Uh, I mean, it was the era, again, you talk about discrimination. Yeah, the gays now have rights. They struck down all the laws. That all sounds great, right? There's no more discrimination. By the late 1970s, I mean, New York and San Francisco, they were, oh my god, they had, they had these gay bathhouses all over the place. You know, just basically like sex clubs, you know, where you would just go. And this, of course, is where the AIDS epidemic came from. I mean, in the end, this is the thing. is like, Burke had this great phrase. You know, he said, freedom, freedom. What does it mean, right, freedom? You're breaking down all the barriers. Now you're free. Here's what he said. Look, the effect of freedom upon men or women is that they may do what they please. We should perhaps see what it pleased them to do before we risk congratulations. <laughs> you know, so that by the end of the 1970s, a whole country, which had been this, you know, okay, a little bit boring, admittedly, like back, it's kind of a boring place in the 50s, right? You know, conformist, Christian, even like racially, you know, it was, it was the whitest it had ever been. We have this phrase, white bread, which is not usually a compliment. You know, it's sort of like, you know, white people famously, like, they can't dance. You know, they have no style and all of that, right? They're, they're a little boring, right? Fashions are boring. You know, there are no exciting. Like, the idea of the disco hasn't even been invented. The idea of the club where men and women would both go to a bar. Those things don't even exist. So it was a boring place. So people, you know, they tore down a lot of these old structures. But, again, they kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater. All of those things had held together some kind of social glue. And Americans are now, as I talked about last week, nostalgic, of course, for what they lost. Nostalgic for these mid-century days when it seemed like the country actually had a coherent identity. When it seemed like, yes, it was a bit conformist, but people actually you know, believed in their institutions, believed in their elders, had respect for their parents instead of, you know, the, famously the hippies, of course, just they all ran away from home and they didn't care about mom and dad. The last major institution I'm going to talk about, just because it has an immense impact on you know, everything that follows in America up to the current day, um, was the Immigration Reform Act of 1965. This, again, it's one of those things where when you first hear it, it sounds sensible. By 1965, America didn't really even have immigrants, shocking as it is to think. Uh, America's gone through these phases, like in the late 19th century, the late 1800s, up to about the First World War, you know, there was a huge wave of people coming in, mostly from Italy, like if they get the Godfather, right, the Italian mafia types, people coming in from southeastern Europe. And then they actually stopped. In 1924, they just basically cut off immigration, especially from Japan and China, but basically from everywhere. You know, they lowered the quotas. By the 1960s, America was no longer a nation of immigrants. That's the cliche. They weren't letting people in. So part of the reason for the homogeneity, and you might even say the boredom of the culture before the 60s, was that the country actually was acculturating everyone. Yeah, you know, it was like the, the grand area where you know, everyone spoke English. They were losing their accents. Everyone would even, like the Italians would change their names. Like Richie Valiant, Richie Valens, I talked about the story with Buddy Holly and you know, the, the musicians of the 1950s. His actual name was, of course, Ricardo Valenzuela. But everyone was like anglicizing their names. Everyone was trying to fit in. This is before Americans had decided that all cultures but their own are actually better than their own. What happened? 1965, they changed the laws. It was probably because they weren't getting immigrants anymore. No one was coming because they had these quotas by country. Like the Germans weren't coming to America because, well, they were all in Germany and Germany was booming and so why would they even want to go to America? So they opened up a couple of spots and they said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to allow more immigration in from, you know, the so-called third world and we are going to have what we call a family reunification clause. So that if you come in, all of your family can come in too. 
Now, when they passed this law, they didn't think much of it. Ed, Ted Kennedy gave the speech. He said, look, you know, it's not going to change the composition much. It's just going to, you know, kind of like maybe alter the comp. We'll get a few less from Europe, a few more from other countries, no big deal. What they didn't realize, of course, was the principle of chain migration. It's a little bit like compound interest. Once you let in people from different families, then you began letting in everyone. So they began letting in, of course, famously the Mexicans. Huge waves of Mexicans come in to the point where now, you know, you can basically drive through California without meeting someone who speaks English. If you drive like the right part, you get people from all the rest of the country. And again, it sounds great. Like at first, Americans love the idea. They, they call it vibrancy. You get like better food, right? That's not like American food was famously bad back in the 50s. <laughs> you know, it was all really boring. No taste, no spice. So yeah, they, you know, they bring in all the immigrants, add a little spice to life. The problem with something like that, though, is, of course, that eventually, again, the social glue begins to kind of unwind. You no longer get people agreeing about things like what the common language is, what to teach in the schools. The Mexicans, of course, have a different view of the Mexican-American War than the Americans do. And so now you have to get together in these like textbook committees. And you have to say, well, this is our version of the story. That's your version of the story. We'll have to either split the difference or we'll have to tell both versions of the story. Now, more than that, when you look at the eventual erosion, that is, of the kind of the national cohesion of America, is that, of course, it affected the government. Of course, it affected the foreign policy. I already talked about the collapse in Vietnam, the fact that Congress literally voted to cut off funding for both Vietnam and Cambodia right before they collapsed and the Khmer Rouge plunged into Phnom Penh. Interestingly, shortly after this, in fact, the month after the zero hour at Phnom Penh, you know, when the city is emptied of three million people. It was interesting. An American, I think it was like a fishing boat or something, it was off the coast there. It wasn't a military boat. It was just like a boat with a bunch of Americans on board. It was actually taken in, taken prisoner by the Cambodians, by the Khmer Rouge. The Americans then tried to liberate their, you know, civilian, like, fishing trawler from the Cambodians. The Cambodians. <laughs> and, and America lost, I think, 50 soldiers and four helicopters in a rescue operation against the Cambodians. <laughs> this is how far America had fallen. No, it had gotten to the point where it wasn't just like the army again. Everyone was, you know, shooting up drugs and all of the rest of it. But America's own politicians didn't even trust the army any longer, right? They basically thought, look, you know, they're all potheads and the country hates us. And it's true, you know, the hippies had turned everyone against the army and they all called them like, there are all these movies from the 80s, like Tom Cruise was in this one where they talk about the soldiers getting abused as they came back and blamed for, you know, and yeah, some of them had committed atrocities in Vietnam. But basically it was like the army was discredited. They had eliminated the draft finally, only there were no volunteers. So America's army is beginning to fall apart. Now that America is spending a lot on welfare and so on, deficit spending, they start to cut the military spending. By 1976, it had gotten to the point where, I think I mentioned this before, the defense secretary under Ford was actually Donald Rumsfeld, at the time the youngest defense secretary, you know, before he would later be the oldest one under Bush. And he did this famous review, basically saying, like, look, the state of our you know, Navy around the world, America's Navy, which had been Basically, it blanketed the oceans in 1945. He said, well, we could maybe just barely control the North Atlantic sea lanes. Can't control the Eastern Mediterranean anymore. The Soviets are now there. We can't defend Japan. That's about it. America, the superpower hegemon, was by 1976 unable to defeat the Cambodians, unable to even supply the Israelis, the last time they actually supplied the Israelis, and that's the, the 1973 war, right before the Arab oil embargo. After that, they lost this ability. The Soviets had actually taken over. The Soviets literally took over the former American bases in Vietnam. They took over several American bases in the Middle East. America was just essentially withdrawing from the world. The Soviets, meanwhile, of course, were expanding famously in Africa, Abyssinia, or you know, Ethiopia, Angola. They were using these Cuban you know, mercenary auxiliaries. Um, famously, of course, they invaded Afghanistan in 1979. By about 1980, it wasn't just that the dollar was melting away. I talked about this. You had you know, no confidence in the dollar, I suppose. Oh, I think that was down here. Um, no confidence in the dollar is, I suppose, ultimately the sign of you know, the, the, uh, the social political health or competence of the U.S. and its government. The dollar, again, falls to almost 900 
dollars an ounce by 1980. Uh, the country is just literally practically fallen apart in terms of foreign policy. Its own allies no longer trust it. Um, there's that phrase, I've repeated it before, but I love it, you know, the Osama bin Laden phrase, right? You know, when you see a strong horse and a weak horse, you back the strong horse. America in the 1970s was a very weak horse. Had very little ability left to even compel its allies to do anything. I suppose maybe it was true that in Turkey they did, uh, I don't know the real story of the 1980 coup. Presumably the Americans were involved in some you know, indirect peripheral way. So they hadn't completely given up on kind of the Cold War intrigue. But basically everything was running in the Soviet direction. Not least because of course the run up in oil prices meant money in the pocket for the Soviet Union. So if you were a betting man in 1979, 1980, you probably would have thought that the Soviets were going to win the Cold War. And I wouldn't have gainsaid you. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop it there, and we will then have our quiz on Friday.